episode 14 with Rico Gear. Hello and greetings, barn raisers one and all. It's my great privilege to welcome you back to the greatest show on the planet for anyone interested in how teams really work. And if you're new here, welcome for the first time. We're so happy you made it. You're about to hear a show that is fueled by the insights, inspiration and stories that I share from the conversations that I have with the world's ultimate team players. Ever wondered how Olympians approach team culture? You can find out here. Want to know how an award-winning filmmaker manages to collaborate with others? We share that here. Want to know about how an FBI kidnapping negotiator can influence terrorists, hostages, panic-stricken families and law enforcement all at once to work together for a positive outcome? We've got you covered. You get the picture. So let's get things moving. But before we kick off, I want to give a big shout out to all the American barn raisers listening in. Hope you guys had a great holiday and got to spend some time with the team that you value most, your family and friends. It's crazy to me how fast we're charging towards the end of another year. But I digress. Let's get back on track. You're going to love this episode. We've got another great conversation with another amazing guest. The show starts now. Rico Gear is one of the most popular and celebrated members of the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team. It's a status he earned while slicing through opposition defences and scoring tries all over the world for over 17 years. But watching him perform on the world sporting stage was definitely not how I first met Rico. In fact, I'll tell you the story. I actually forced my way into Rico's world at a Tony Robbins UPW event in Sydney earlier this year. You probably know who Tony Robbins is. He's the big guy with the huge teeth. He does peak performance training and seminars all over the world to thousands of people at a time. Anyway, I rocked into the event in Sydney this year, and of course, the room was huge and there were something like 6,000 people there. So I walked in, I picked my spot and sat down, and after about two minutes, this guy comes and sits next to me, and he immediately starts complaining about how long it took to get in which is not a good start, considering that I already know I have to spend at least the next 10 hours doing some pretty intense stuff with whoever I'm sitting next to. Anyway, a minute later, a lady sits in front of me, and she has huge hair, the sort of hair that immediately blocked out 99% of the stage. It wasn't a good start. So graciously, I told the guy sitting next to me that I had to move, and I walked to the aisle and started my search for a new seat partner. It was then that I spied a spot and immediately I turned my attention to the seat in front of me. No big hair. That's a good start. And then I turned my attention to the guy that I'd be sitting next to. He was standing up, not necessarily smiling, but definitely didn't look unhappy. There were two women sitting next to him talking and I thought, he's going to need a partner. And so do I. Check and check. So I made my way down the aisle and asked if anyone was sitting there. So I made my way down the aisle and asked if anyone was sitting there. He said no. I could tell from his accent he was a Kiwi. So I thought, bonus, someone from out of town, which will make it even more interesting. So I sat down. We didn't say much, but the partner exercises started soon enough, and we were talking in no time at all. As the questions started getting thrown at us, we started getting into our backgrounds and what we did. He simply said, I have my own online business, and I used to play a bit of professional rugby overseas. Cool, I thought. He's into sport. And I wondered briefly if he'd be down for coming onto the podcast and talking about some of the teams he played with. I didn't think too much about it. Anyway, before I knew it, the exercise had moved on to me and it was my turn to share. And the event carried on. Then at one point, he turned to me and said, what's your name again? I said, Dan Stones. And he asked for my phone number to stay in touch over the next four days. Nothing strange there. I then asked him his and he said, I'm Rico Gear. And he gave me his number. Awesome. I thought I made a friend. Anyway, later that day, and I think it was about our first break seven hours in. If you've been to a Tony Robbins event, you'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I noticed a lot more people started coming up to Rico to say hi. 
Now, people at Tony Robbins are very friendly. And again, I didn't think too much of it. So the day continued. I learned that the two girls were Rico's sister-in-law and someone who was part of his business team. Anyway, at the end of the night, there's a big lead up into a firewalk experience and the 6,000 people start moving around and they go their separate ways. Half of them are terrified and the other half are super excited. And so we headed for the fire and all the excitement and we ended up going our separate ways. That night though, when I finally got back to the hotel, I thought how great the day was and that Rico, my new friend, was such a cool guy. I decided to see if I could find out a bit more about his professional rugby career, just to see what was going on. So I fired up Google and put in Rico Gear, international rugby player. And that's when, as you probably know, I was bombarded with all these news articles, images, YouTube videos of Rico playing for the New Zealand All Blacks. To say I felt a little bit embarrassed was probably an understatement. Long story short, I didn't sit with Rico again, but we did catch up at most of the breaks and we did speak every day. At some point, I also noticed how many more people were actually saying hi and that they were actually taking selfies when they were with him and all sorts of crazy stuff. He laughed when I told him about all of this and we've stayed in contact since. He really is a great guy and he's so generous with his time and help to make this conversation happen. Now, back to the real story. Rico is a former All Black and Commonwealth Gold Medalist with the New Zealand Sevens. He's definitely a team player through and through and his contribution and experience in building the brand new team culture for the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team in the mid-2000s was actually pivotal in setting the team on a course that would see them win two consecutive World Cups in 2011 and 2015. And it was that run that saw them being regarded as one of the best sporting teams in history, according to Sam Walker, another Barn Raisers alumni. But more on that a little later in the show. Now, I've spoken enough. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce you to my friend and former New Zealand All Black, Rico Gear. One of the things I wanted to start with was just a bit of your, your heritage, a bit about your family. So, yeah, originally uh, born and, and, and bred in a, a small city called Gisborne um, on the east coast of the North Island. Um, kind of a, a small city of around 40,000 people. My, my parents um, were heavily invested in sport uh, when we were growing up. Brought up in the city and then often on school holidays and weekends would spend a bit of time out on the farm, um, out on the sheep stations and, of course, in the stock trucks, cattle trucks and all that sort of stuff. And around, I guess with my mouldy background, I probably wasn't immersed uh, in it as much as I would have liked to have been. But my grandparents were, were fluent speakers of the language. So, you know, when we were around them, it was, off, it was very um, uh, noticeable, um, you know, when I was growing up. And then, of course, the haka being a huge part of, um, I guess, tying us all back to, to the culture was something that, we were definitely, I guess, a part of within our schools, and um, and a lot of my very good friends were a part of multicultural groups, um, which I nearly became a part of if it wasn't for rugby. So, right, yeah, but but definitely my parents being the major influence, they were, you know, right into basketball, netball, rugby, and rugby league. Um, we were also swimmers, so morning and night training uh, for swimming, and of course. Dabbled in surf life saving, but and also played a lot of touch rugby from about the age of 13, and all amongst that, yeah, playing a bit of rugby. So I think that was a good thing about being from Gisborne. Um, you were able to achieve uh, uh, a lot, I guess, and in terms of being a part of a, a large number of different sports and activities, um, I guess it allowed us to do that. Yeah, and it's continued on. I mean, post your post the um, the rugby days, and we're going to get into all of that stuff. We're going to talk about the yep. Haka and obviously your experience as, all, as an All Black. You're also now sort of continuing your own sporting legacy with, with your family at the moment on the Gold Coast. Is that right? Yeah, yep. So we've just been out, uh, been on the Gold Coast about eight or nine months now. Um, my partner, Beck, uh, is Australian and her uh, family are based out here. So we've been coming backwards and forwards, you know, to the Gold Coast for the last four or five years. And um, finally made the made the move over and yeah, just absolutely loving it. Uh, the lifestyle's um, amazing, and of course the weather uh, compared to New Zealand, it's not even fair. So no, it's great. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. But I think the, the countryside and the and the scenery of New Zealand's pretty hard to top, no matter no matter where you are. 
And your partner, Beck, I could have easily have um, invited her on the show too, I think. For those that don't know, she's obviously a, uh, a basketballer of some note. Yes, yes, she was. Uh, I think she was one of the youngest to ever play in the women's, I think it's QBL. Mm-hmm. Um, and she played, she was a captain uh, of her college team in America, Boston College. So she's always been uh, a, a very good basketballer. And of course, her... Her uncle was is Jean Miles, who played rugby league for Australia and is a selector for Queensland uh, for the Maroons. So, again, yeah, she has a lot of sporting history um, in her family as well, which is cool. I love it. So let's let's turn our attention then back to you and let's talk a little about the, about the New Zealand All Blacks. And and the question I want to start with is just how hard is it to become a New Zealand All Black? Man, that's a great question. I think it is it is really difficult. Um, and, and if I look back over history, you know, over the last 110 years or so, you know, I think we've only had uh, a little over a, a thousand All Blacks. Um, and I think with it being our number one sport in New Zealand, you know, I think majority of, of, of uh, you know, young, young boys grow up wanting to be All Blacks. So we're all fighting to, you know, eventually be a part of this great team and, um, you know, we probably have that realisation probably around the age of 13 to 15, um, you know, whether or not we're going to continue with the game. So, but I, I think it is really, really not that easy. And and in the past, if you came from a small city like Gisborne, you'd often get overlooked. So again, more difficult uh, from, you know, if you're from a smaller centre. But now, um, I think, you know, the, the New Zealand Rugby Union is certainly, they're, they're not letting, you know, any anyone... <laughs> Uh, you know, leave. So um, the, the the systems they have in place now, uh, you know, nobody really gets overlooked now, which is great. Right. And, and then following on from that, breaking into that team, and, and I want to take you back to when you started. How old were you when you first got into the all, on, onto the All Black scene? How old were you? When I actually made the All Black team, I, oh, I want to say, I think I was around 25. So a little bit later than, than some some guys. I think but for me, I think it was probably about the right time. I think a few years earlier, I probably I probably hadn't matured enough as a rugby player, you know, mentally and physically. So I was a bit of a, um, I matured a lot later and I had a lot of injuries early in my career. So yeah, around around the mid-20s was when I first had my first test and I knew that I was definitely ready by that stage. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the amount of work leading up to that would have been, would have been huge. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, stepping stones along the way, I was lucky enough to be a part of the New Zealand Sevens team. We we won a gold medal at the Commonwealth Games. I think it was the first time that Sevens had been uh, inducted into the Commonwealth Games. And I think I was 19 at the time, but I was surrounded by some of our greatest All Blacks uh, that have ever played the game. Two in particular, Jonah Lombu and Christian Cullen. They were both a part of um, this this uh, Sevens side that, that I, I got to experience at such a young age. Yep. And I think, you know, mentally that, that, that probably put me in, in good, you know, speed for, for moving forward and around professionalism, expectation, and, and just sort of what it takes to, I guess, perform at that, at that higher level, being surrounded by these guys. Yeah, and that's, that's an interesting point because I think I'd love to know, and you always hear about these people talk about the culture that they have in these teams, but my interest would really be when you first walked in at this point of your career, what was the first thing you noticed about that culture? It was almost like at that time, uh, which was 2004, you kind of, you step into that environment and there's just a huge expectation. Um, they really ram home the, you know, the expectation that, of course, you play for your country and all that sort of stuff. But, but more so, you know, we think about the people that have worn the jersey before us. We really tap into the history of the All Blacks you know, the success, the great leaders, and, and we really very quickly buy right into that. And again, even even the jersey itself, you know, we talk about the blackness of the jersey, the silver fern, and, and what it represents. And there is a there is this mystique, <laughs> um, strange mystique around the, the jersey itself, and, um, and comes with that a whole lot of responsibility. So, when I first went into the ABs, that was probably the first thing that was really noticeable. And then within about 12 months, there was a huge cultural shift, you know, from what was the All Blacks to what is now. And, and it basically started, yeah, when I first um, 
about 12 months after I made the side. Okay. So it was, it was interesting to watch that transition. What, what was the sort of the key shift that you sort of noticed? Was it an attitude type of shift? Was it the expectation changed? I wouldn't imagine the expectation changed much. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, that's right. It was, it was definitely more around an atti- attitude shift, certainly around professionalism. You know, by that stage, the game had been nearly professional probably eight or nine years, yet yet, yet the behaviours of the players were probably still of the past. You know, were still of the amateur days where uh, uh, past All Black teams, you know, the, the guys that weren't involved with the playing squad, you know, you'd, you'd go out and get drunk in the middle of the week and then, of course, you'd, you'd enjoy the occasion, the win or loss after the game and you'd have another big night. So definitely the drinking culture, um, that was definitely removed uh, and put, put to one side. So that was a huge shift around that. Yep. And then the haka, which, which had been with the team for 100 years, uh, it was the boys felt that that particular haka was not quite relatable to you know, what, what we were about as All Blacks. We kind of did that particular haka because it was traditional – and, 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 that, and that was great. So, so what we did is we didn't get rid of that haka. We, we kept that one, but we created a new one. And, and with that, you know, we're all about creating legacy, but also, again, just buying into the current culture uh, and, and what's relatable to us as a nation, as a team, you know, in, in the current time. Now, that development of that culture, though, was that something that, uh, and this is a particular passion of mine with what I do with, with, with my training programs, but was that driven by the players and were they respon- were given the responsibility for developing that culture or was it something that was sort of handed to them and said, this is the culture you're now going to adopt? How did that sort of shift happen? Um, it, 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 I think it was just a, a collective of, of all of those things. Um, so within the All Blacks, we have a leadership group and that usually involves probably about seven or eight players Um, and of course your management team and then also we have a a mental skills coach um, who was a part of the team he still is today so I think I think just on the back of 2004 we had a big a real big drink up session and I think just some of those people noticed that things needed to change it was on the back of a really heavy loss um, to the Springboks in South Africa so there was just a real need for change. So that definitely came from, from within the playing group, but but I think as well as the management. Right. And did, did you enjoy that shift? Was it something that the players obviously embraced and, and were happy to have, or was there some resistance to it? I think we all had buy-in, but just like anything, old habits die a little bit hard. So I think there were there were there there was a little bit of resistance because – it kind of felt like we're adults here. We we can make good decisions, yet it feels like we're being dictated to a little bit in terms of what you can and can't do. So I think initially there was probably a little bit of resistance, but what the boys sort of realised is that you know it's not about the individual. It's about it's about the team. It's about the bigger picture. And our management team are very very good at you know casting casting the vision of, of what we want to achieve. It would have been a fascinating time, I'd imagine, just to see that happening. Were you aware of what was happening at, at the time, like the, the the nature of that shift, or was it just sort of a gradual thing that built up? Yeah, 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 that's it. That's it. I think it was just, you know, well, I think it was just a, it was just a gradual thing, but 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 in all, uh, you know, every board into knowing that's a step in the right direction. And, you know, and, 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 and it took it took a number of years to, to, to refine it all, and so that when... When new players came into the environment, um, it was an easy transition. You know, the, the, the All Blacks are really huge on on when people come in, they, they want people to be themselves. They don't want people to come in feeling restricted or, you know, sitting there quietly or hiding at the back of the room. It's, it's very, everybody's very inclusive and uh, everybody is, you know, can contribute. So, they make people feel very comfortable, and I think you know it's. it's I guess it's been a reflection of, of the results, um, particularly over the last ten years. And you must take some great pride in those results that are being achieved now. Sort of saying that well, we we sort of helped push that rock over the edge, if you like, to get that ball rolling. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I mean, I never really reflected back too much on it, um, but thinking about it now, I guess it was great to be a part of that. You know, that transition and the course. You know, as a as a, as a former player. You, you always want to see see the team do well, and yeah, it is amazing the amount of uh, 
success, you know, that the side does, you know, that they do have for, I guess, New Zealand being such a small nation and on the on the scale of it, um, I think their success rate's around 80-something percent win rate or something. So it is pretty phenomenal, which is, you know, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's an amazing win ratio and what the team's been able to achieve with different players too. I mean, this is the thing I spoke to in our last episode. I spoke to a coach who was part of a team that had rattled off over I think it was 12 years, they won 150 games in a row. And that means that there's different players coming on board. So something, yeah. something's yeah. got to be constant in there. And I, I, I tend to think that there's this team culture that exists that is the thing that carries aside from one, one group of players to the next group of players. Yeah, 100%. And, and, I, and I think on top of that, the, you know, our management team, they know that, that players are going to be replaced all the time. Players are going to fall over, get injured. And they know very well that whoever steps into that role is going to be just as good. So player management and player development is, is uh, I think, a huge key you know, driver in, in the success of the All Blacks as well. And, and I know that the All Black management spend lots and lots of time you know, bringing those guys through so that when they do play for the All Blacks, they're they're ready to they're ready to go. So, and, and then there's that that point you just raised though about still letting those players who are coming in still be themselves and make their own unique contribution. There's a lot of talk these days about having, especially on sporting teams, people come in and are expected just to play a role, and the roles cast. That's what you're coming in to do. But it's interesting that you mentioned that it's still very important that those people that are coming in are still allowed to be themselves. Yeah, no, that's right. And, and, and as you'd know, you know, we all have different personality types. So with the likes of the Polynesian and Maori cultures, you know, our boys are generally very, very shy. Um, they're very, very quiet. Um, so in the All Black management, they know that when, when we get these players in, we want them to be expressive. So, you know, it's like, how do we do that? Well, you know, you'll probably find that when they are expressive, they're around family members at home. So they've created this whole family culture where, um, you know, the players can come in, like I was saying, and, and, and just be free to to be themselves. And, and, of course, enjoyment is a huge, huge part of it. You talk about balance and stuff. I know that they, I know that the, the team, uh, you know, in the middle of the week, they will have one or two uh, quiet beers or, or, or a glass of wine in a, in a social uh, setting, but it, it is as a team, so there's a little bit of where you know you can just switch off. So they do bring all of this in into the environment as well. So, and I think that's an important point too. You mentioned like expectations at the top there, and there is strong expectations, but there's a difference between expectations and culture, isn't there? There's there's the expectations on the team and the culture of the team aren't tied together. But I think in business you see it a lot where people say, "Well, here's the expectation we've got." And that expectation becomes the culture. Yeah, yeah But I think yeah. you've you've almost got to keep those two separate, separate. Yeah. A- and be very clear on what those are. Yeah, no, no, definitely, definitely. And the culture that that is driven, you know, especially especially now, it, it does come more so uh, from the players themselves. They they create a lot of what goes on in the environment now because at the end of the day, it's what the players want to do um, and what they want. So. As a collective, it is driven internally, and then, um, you know, with the expectation, that's often driven through the management, but with the support of the leadership players, uh, so that you get buy-in from the rest of the group, and, and you're right, they, they are very separate things. Yeah, and I think there's also that idea that there's, I like to talk about two cultures in any organisation, a sporting team, whatever it is. Mm. There's the There's the corporate culture, which is sort of the... You know, the, the stuff that we put on the walls, the things that we tell everyone else what the culture is. Yeah. But then you can't get away from the fact there's this secondary culture, which is the team culture, which is which is the group of players. It's the people in that working group, that project team, whatever it is, they'd have their own culture. You just got to try and work out how do you align the two of them. Yeah, and, and I guess a lot of the things that the ABs do, you know, a lot of that, that, that cultural stuff that makes... Um, that's successful is, you know, a lot of it's behind closed doors as well. So it's a lot of stuff that we don't see or, or, or hear about. And often it's some of those smaller things, you know, that, that, that are brought in to, um, you know, make, I guess, make everyone feel more inclusive and, and a part of, um, you know, part of the team. And Well, let's change it up a little bit. Let's, let's move on and let's, let's talk about the haka. Can you explain to the listeners in other countries that are listening what the haka is, how it works, and, and just a little bit about what it represents? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I think what we see and what everybody else has seen in terms of the haka, it's it's uh, a challenge. So it's a it's a it's an acknowledgement um, to the opposition. Uh, it is a it is a it is something of respect as well. It's it's like we know you guys are here to challenge us, so we express that through haka. So we kind of it's kind of our way of setting the challenge, but. Um, also knowing that we're about to receive a challenge. So so that's what the haka is. And often, I mean, there are many different forms of haka as well. There's hundreds, there's hundreds and hundreds uh, different types of haka as well. Now, a haka is also used for celebration. So it's also used in support of something. So it could be used in support of somebody graduating or somebody getting married, or you'll often see it at uh, particularly Māori weddings, you know, there'll be lots of haka around, um, you know, supporting, um, I guess, what's what, what, what they're there for. So that's another part of what haka is all about. And I guess the main parts of the haka itself is, you know, we are drawing on, of course, ancestry, ancestors, that's a huge part of it. You know, we carry our heritage, our culture with us, um, our family, and you and you see that through the I guess through the tattoos and all that sort of stuff. And then again, there's also a huge connection with the Maori culture with the land. So, you know, the stomping of the feet into the land, again, it's kind of like we're drawing on the strength and energy of our ancestors who have passed. You know, we kind of we bring them their energy in up through us and then we express that through our eyes you know, through our facial features and all that sort of stuff, through the breath of life and all that sort of stuff. So um, so there's a little bit of an overview. Yeah, no, fantastic. Thank you. Just is it something that you actually go out and, and consciously practice? Um, probably uh, within the all-black environment, we'd get somebody from outside the group to come in and train the guys on it. Of course, all of us uh, have been brought up watching the all-blacks do the haka, so we already know the haka anyway. Um, but then, of course, we created that new haka, which we spent a lot of time, you know, creating and fine tuning with the help of a, a tutor that came in. So most of that done was done in house in terms of the actual training of it. And was that new haka something that's is that unique to the All Blacks? Sorry if it's a, a, an ignorant question, or is that a traditional haka that that you've you have adopted? No, it's 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 unique to the All Blacks. So the leadership group, we wanted something that that really brought the present. You know the current uh, team in mind. We, we you know, and and, and we realise that the All Blacks are made up of different cultures as well. We have Fijian, Samoan, Tongan. Um, you know, we've got New Zealanders, New Zealand Maori. So we we wanted to we wanted to bind all of that together as well. Um, so again, we've got connection with it. Uh, so we're not just doing a haka for the sake of it. We've got a a real ownership and. Um, we know what pride over that, and but at the same time, it brings us together as one one side and, and uh, one culture, I guess, within the All Blacks. So, yeah, so now the boys really, really loved the idea of that, and, and it just made so much sense because the other haka we were just doing for the sake of it because it was traditional, yet yet we didn't really have that real buy-in, that real connection with the haka the real connection of the haka to the team and all that sort of stuff. So it became a real team ritual as you, as you adopted this new one. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And, 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 and we, and we kind of kept that haka unique and special and we'd only, they only use it sometimes. They don't, they don't use it all the time. We'll, we'll we stick to the traditional one. Um, but for a big occasion or, or just a time where the team is maybe under pressure you know, it, we might revert back to the, the new haka to bring us back together again and, and, and really set the challenge, um, you know, for, for the opposition, but also for ourselves. So so it is, it is special to the team. And speaking of it being special, I mean, there's some amazing YouTube footage. I'm going to actually put links to it um, in the show notes. But there's footage of you being the actual leader of the haka as well on field in front of however many, yeah. <laughs> like 100,000 people. Okay. Before we get into how that feels, and I'm guessing it's pretty good, yeah. But how does how does that work? Do you get chosen, or are you nominated as someone who does that? Yeah, like I think Richie McCaw at the time just gave me a tip on the shoulder, and he was like, "You know, are you okay to lead the hucker?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'm all in." Um, obviously, they'd have a discussion amongst their leadership group, but generally, it, it's it's somebody of Maori heritage that would lead the hucker. Um, you know, and somebody that is quite 
I guess, connected to the to to, to the Maori uh, the Maori culture as well. And often it's it's somebody who's actually starting in the team. Now and again, there'd be a bench player because obviously we may not have the right person that's starting. So, um, and there have been occasions where neither of that's been available. So they'll revert to the next leader within the team. And um, in the past, I think uh, I think Tana Umanga, who was captain of the All Blacks, he led the odd hucker as well. Um, so generally, someone who commands a lot of respect um, will, will, can lead it as well. And what was it like? I mean, the footage that's on YouTube is, is spectacular when you're watching it. But what's that like being out on the field when you're actually doing it? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's, it is a huge honour. Um, I think because, you know, from such a young age, you watch the All Blacks and you, and you watch the leaders of the Haka. And if you ask most kids now what they love about the All Blacks, they'll say the Haka because, you know, that, that always set the tone for the game and it's what got us all excited. So, no, it was a huge honour. And, I mean... You know, especially with my, 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 my background, but also a lot of my very close friends and family are heavily invested in, in the culture, um, and a lot of them are full-time, you know, whether it's through Māori television or cultural performances. So, um, you know, and I know to a lot of them, that's like the pinnacle of, of haka is, is leading the All Blacks in haka. So, you yeah, reflecting on that, it, it was definitely a, a huge a huge moment, and, and uh, no, certainly very... Very proud of it. You sort of, I guess I've never really thought about it, but it is nice to reflect on. Yeah, for sure. Have you seen, I mean, you would have seen it, wouldn't you? The the videos on YouTube where it's got, because it, it, it literally people put in like a top 10. It's like, um, it's like video hits with music. <laughs> they do like a, a YouTube top 10 of the Hucker and you can go through and watch all these different ones that are in there. <laughs> have you ever, have you ever seen any of them? I've seen some of them. I've seen some of the Hucker yeah. Of, uh, yeah, just, just over the years. Uh, it's, it's, it's phenomenal to watch. It's fantastic. For a lot of people outside, it looks very aggressive. Yep. Is your mentality one of aggression when you're doing it? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. So again, it goes back, it goes back to that challenge. So if we go back through Maori history, keeping it basically and keeping it simple, you know, we go back to tribal war uh, within New Zealand, um, where different parts of New Zealand would would battle, you know, for war. They would start with a haka. So each side would start with a haka, and it was kind of like either you're going to die or I'm going to die. So when you do the haka, it's 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 done with massive aggression because you're fighting for your life. Yeah, right. And then that that gets met with most teams just standing there and watching. But yeah. there's this there was footage, and I don't know how if it's iconic footage or it's just something that happens from time to time. But there's one I think the All Blacks versus France where they get into like an arrow formation. Yep. And they move forward in an arrow towards the haka, and the commentators are like losing their mind, going, "What yeah. the hell's going to happen?" <laughs> um, is that normal? And, and are you really concentrating on the opposition while you're doing it, or are you sort of just performing the haka with your team and your teammates? No, yeah, you definitely focus on the opposition because it's me against you. And but that's but but at the same time, that, that that's great that the opposition want to uh, adopt something like that because. Um, you know, it's just an acknowledgement that they they are accepting the challenge. That's all it really is, and it's it's like that's awesome. You know, it's it's game on, and mentally, it's 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 kind of like, oh, yep, the, these guys are up for the challenge. You know, so so I've got to make sure that 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 men- mentally I'm switched on for this. You know, for this occasion. And my last one on the hucker then is: Who do you think the hucker has the biggest impact on? Is it the crowd? Is it the opposition? Or is it you and your teammates? Yeah, the, the, the haka is always about is about what we want to achieve, and the whole the whole reason we do it is because it's it's it represents us as a group. So we don't really it's, it's it doesn't really matter what happens externally. You know, it doesn't really matter what the opposition do. They can do spearheads or or whatever they want. They can, you know, form a circle. It, it doesn't really matter because it's we're just in tune with with why we're doing it and. And I kind of tie it back to that Tony Robbins uh, event. And, you know, we talk about peak state. I think the haka is something that gets the players into that peak state. And and that's if, if, if there's an advantage of doing the haka, you know, versus the opposition standing there in a, in a straight line watching, I, I can't see how they can get into peak state, state just standing there watching. Whereas us performing the, the haka, I, I can definitely relate it to getting the mind, the body, and spirit into peak state before we perform. So, 
that's something I'll probably took away from that event. Yeah, and that's really powerful. I mean, we do that with teams that we train as well. We will often give them an incantation to do as a group. Yep. Um, which is, and it starts off. You say, "Here's here's what you guys can adopt and do," and they start off just talking, and sort of it gets a bit louder by the end of it. They're using their whole body, they're moving, and you can actually see those states actually change. Um, and it has a an, an, an amazing impact on the group as they as they become a team for those for those couple of minutes while they're doing it. Yeah, hundred percent. And I remember that other one we did as well, that primary one we did where you're breathing in and out your nose and then you're doing like you you are pushing your hands in the air and then um you know with your eyes closed and, and you can that you can just change your the physiology in your body, you know, once you've finished that, again you 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 switched on and ready to go. So yeah, no, interesting. It is, and it can, it, and I don't think enough businesses do that because they're everyone's sort of in their in their hole, in their they're being shy or whatever it is. They've got to be reserved or yeah. however it works. But you're leaving so much on the table in terms of your own performance if That's right. if you if you're hunched over and you're sort of quiet all day and, and you're just sort of going about your business. There's so much more in you. Yeah, no, not hundred percent. All right, let's let's move on from the haka, and that was fantastic. Thanks so much for explaining all that for someone who doesn't know. I'm sure we've all got a a new appreciation of it, and, and it's something that um, we can all take a lot out of, actually. Yeah. It's really interesting stuff. Uh, pleasure. I'm going back to another guest of the show yep. uh, who I had on, who was a guy called Sam Walker, and he wrote a book called The Captain Club. And what he did was a study, if you haven't heard, I think it's on episode six, maybe. I'll put it in the show notes anyway for people that are listening. Yeah. But he did, a, he did a study of every sporting team in the world, basically. He started off and said, well, what sports am I going to include? And then narrowed it all the way down but there was thousands of teams that he went through and he started looking at the leadership of those teams and he, he wrote this amazing book it's it's really worth a read but he actually had the new zealand all blacks in the top 16 sporting teams of all time yeah he had them in there twice yeah great and and that just is amazing on so many levels when you're thinking about competing on a world stage mm. in multiple sports and he's not, as I said, he's not a Kiwi. He was an American guy. So it wasn't like it was, no, it wasn't a hometown decision or anything like that. But the, the two people he spoke about um, in terms of the All Blacks and then he really goes into detail on were the captains of those eras. One was Wayne Shelford. Yep. And the other one was Richie McGraw, who is also obviously a, um, a teammate of yours. Yeah. And so I thought it'd be interesting just to go over some of the questions that he came up with or these things that he he uncovered about the captains of these 16 teams because they're not they're not the typical captains. They're not the the superhero mold with a cape behind them. They're very different. So before we go into what those questions were and sort of tracking against what Sam thought to what you experienced, what sort of teammate was Richie like? Richie McCaw. He um he was all about action, um, and I think you know we, we, we've we've seen that before with with great leaders. They they just take action, and 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 I think what was really noticeable about him is he was just so professional about the way he did things. You could you could see he meant business, um, uh, you know, around even even just in training. He was always one thing I noticed about Richard. He was always the first guy on the training paddock. It didn't matter. It didn't matter where we were what what game uh, it was or even if it was a practice game or an international it didn't matter Richie was a guy he, he was always had his boots on first and he was always warming up before everybody else um, you know so that was something that, that he always did he, you know and again that just goes back to leading by example um, and then on top of that just the way he played the game now he, he wasn't actually the most talented player um, that we had in terms of his rugby playing ability, but he mentally he was the toughest guy that I've yeah, ever come across. You know, it didn't matter how tired everyone else or he didn't matter how tired he was, he would just keep going and going. Um, his mental toughness was just amazing. He'd get you know, he'd get targeted in games, he'd get battered, he'd end up with stitches, but he just kept he just kept going. He just had this yeah, phenomenal ability to to go to the end, um, and I think that's what what he had over everybody else. And of course, you know when you've got somebody like that in your side, you know you, it definitely brings your game up. That's for sure. But again, off the field, Richie, he he was a very focused guy. You know he had a lot of other things going on outside of rugby. I think he had a, got a couple of degrees. You know he's a pilot. 
plays bagpipes. So he does a whole lot of stuff that you know we didn't even know about. So, but I but I do know that rugby rugby was his life, and I sort of realised that he even put rugby before relationships. So the whole time I knew Richie, even right through his whole career, I've, I've never known him to have a girlfriend even, and and that's you know I, that's purely because. He was so focused on wanting to be, you know, a great leader, a great captain. Um, it was all about rugby for him. So, yeah, that's that's Richie McCall. Now, for people that did listen to to Sam's episode, and if you don't, go back and have a listen because he talks about these seven characteristics that these people have. So, after you've explained that, so many of the words you've just said in in your explanation have come up in these seven traits so i'll run them past you and you just just like a quick yes uh, um or or, or uh, maybe not so much but let's see how many of these actually ring true from someone who actually played with him so the first one was an extreme doggedness and focus in competition yep number two they exhibit aggressive play that tests the limit of the rules yes definitely <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot in the book. That was one of the particular ones I remember in the book yeah, that yeah. Um, that he spoke about with Richie. He, yeah. he wasn't afraid to push the limits. Um, third, a willingness to do thankless jobs in the shadows. Uh, is that on the field or off the field? Oh, either. A willingness to do mm, probably. I don't know. Not so much. Yeah, not so much that one. All right, cool. What about a low key practical and democratic communication style? Yeah. And and part of that was that they didn't seek the spotlight. They weren't someone who had to be standing in front of a crowd yeah, to yeah, talk. Yeah, and hundred percent. He 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 just went about his work. He's one of the he didn't say much either. Um even, even though he was a captain, it was all about action. Yeah, as you said at the top, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then number five, motivates others with passionate non verbal displays. Yeah, hundred percent. Action again, yeah. action again. Yeah. yeah. All right, strong convictions yes. and a courage to stand apart. Yep, yep, definitely. And the last one they had, which I think nearly everyone at that level must have, which is ironclad emotional control. Oh, he was the, he was the best at it. Like, I don't know how he did it. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was just amazing. It didn't matter what anybody else was doing to him. Uh, I don't think I ever saw that guy give a penalty away or, or or even lose his temperament. Like he just, I've never seen him lose his temper, lose control, just just 100% focused on getting the job done. And that that's that's one of the keys. I mean, that's why Sam has put these, these 16 people yeah. um, who are the captains of these teams up there. So Amazing. that's really interesting because that, that sort of gives the tick to sort of closes the loop on that episode and, and it gives us another sense that, that that's actually when you're looking at leaders, it's not always what you think. Nah, but yeah, I mean those all of those things just you know that hit it on the head. That a great description of of, of Richie there for sure. Oh, fantastic! I, I have to pass it on to Sam and let him know yeah. that yep. <laughs> we've got some verification again for him <laughs> as if he needed it. He was he was so thorough with it; it was amazing. Awesome. All right, so so Rico, the next topic I wanted to touch on because. Obviously, the, the sporting career is one aspect of your life, but life goes on and, and you move past rugby and you go into to doing other things. So what's life after rugby been like for you? And, and have you dabbled in coaching, for instance? What did, what did you enjoy doing sort of after you finished playing professionally? Yeah, I think um, I was very lucky when I finished playing professionally. I, I mean, I had a, a job to go back to in my hometown and it was, it was still um, it was a rugby development um, officer role within the rugby union back in my hometown so it was great that I was able to still be involved with rugby which I thought was a great progression um, out of you know bring a because I've been a professional rugby player for 17 years so you know that had been a, obviously a huge part of my life so um, so I thought yep that was great um, so I've, I worked for the Poverty Bay Rugby Union and within that I um, also coached our local representative side uh, for two years I was I was there um, and basically what I did, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd roll out coaching courses, I'd coach the coaches and, um, you know, look to grow numbers, playing numbers within the region and, you know, we'd set up tournaments and all that sort of stuff. So that's really what I transitioned to uh, once I finished playing professional rugby. Okay. And did you enjoy doing those things? Um, I actually found it really tough, even though I don't think it could have got uh, gotten any easier, to be fair. I think it was just that that complete 
change and turn around and 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 what life was like to what it you know what it is now sitting at my desk you know at eight o'clock in the morning um you know i'd never done that so i think just that realization um was just a little bit it was tough to come to terms with i mean um you know i had great support with my partner beck and we at the time you know we had our um she was pregnant as well so we had a little boy on the way so it was i mean you know that was that was fantastic but just that transition was certainly not an easy um easy, easy thing to come to terms with at, at the time um but again I was, I was surrounded by some really good people even within the job so um so we got through that of course no, no, no worries yeah and i suppose that although it was a transition it was still a transition in the same i suppose industry if you like yeah. you're still you're still in in the sporting arena you've still yeah. got a link to rugby so I mean, some of these players, when they come out, and, yeah. and you see it with military people as well, they come out of those environments with such high standards. Yep. And they come out into into normal life. Yep. And then all of a sudden, it's like, what just happened? It's, it's like a different world. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly right. And, you know, with the, you know, the emotional roller coaster of being a pro athlete where, you know, you're getting yourself into peak state every single weekend, um, you recover, and then you train, and you build up again, and just doing it every week, you know, year after year after year. It's all of a sudden, you know, coming into the zone where there's not much happening. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really need to physically train anymore. Um, I don't really have a game to get ready for uh, this weekend. So again, just those psychological shifts as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then you've got the whole team aspect, which is like what we're talking about on this show. I mean, that that importance that team plays. I mean, you had Beck and you had your son on the way. So you had sort of that that connection, but there's nothing like a really like a, a professional team environment, is there? No, that's right. And I, and I think when I went back home, uh, you know, to to finish up playing rugby and I think the coaching thing certainly helped. Uh, you know, with that, so I was still involved with with my local team, and it was great because I, I still I had a lot of passion for that particular team. Um, it was my first representative side that I played for when I left high school, and then mm-hmm. it was great to do the full three hundred and sixty and come back and contribute back to that same side again. And in a coaching role, I played a few games as well. So, you know, and like you were saying, it was just nice to be a part of something. Um, that, that, you know, when I've been so used to doing that my, my, my entire career. And I think it's the same even today now with, with business and stuff. Like, you know, people want to belong to something, whether it's a club, a team, or no matter what it is, um, you just got to find out, you know, what that is for you. Yeah, and, and jump all in with it too. Yeah. Not hold back and, and really find where you belong. Yeah, that's um, right. I think that's really important. So what is it that you are doing? I mean, you're obviously not coaching. Now you moved from New Zealand, as you said, and now you're in on the Gold Coast. Yep. What does the day look like for you these days? Yeah, so I, um, I, I stayed involved with a little bit of rugby, but it was on my terms. So I did a bit with TSS, the private school out here. Um, got, a, got a very strong rugby program. So um, I'd help them out once a week, which was great to stay involved. And then over the last three years, um, I've been partnered with a global health and wellness company, where we've been able to uh, build a business uh, online um, and at the same time, you know, help people with physical and financial transformations. Uh, and in the process, we, we build a, we build a, a team uh, of people that, um, you know, want to achieve the same thing, either, either through, um, you know, building a business themselves uh, and helping create a little more time freedom and financial freedom for their families. So, um, with this business, I was able to start um, start it when I was working full time at my rugby job. Um, because it's online based, I was basically able to do it in the pockets of time that I had, um, which with with two small children, um, mostly consisted of you know working online, sort of you know eight o'clock at night till ten or eleven o'clock each night. So, um, and once we got to a certain level um, within the business, uh, I was able to walk away from my nine to five. And now I uh, have the ability to, you know, work from wherever I want to work from and, and, and just, you know, spend quality time with, with family and, and just have a little bit more choice, you know, in, in what our days look like, which is, you know, which is phenomenal. Yeah, sensational. And then 
uh, the the question has to be asked. We've talked about <laughs> we've talked about so much in terms of expectations and cultures and things you've been a part of. Mm. How do you how do you or what have you taken out of um, out of those experiences now that you talk about building teams in your in in this um, role that you've got now in this business that you run now? Yeah. What what do you think carries over, and what are some of the things that you've really held on to that you try and instill in the teams that you're building these days? I think we've been very fortunate, and with the company we are aligned with, with Isogenics, we, you know, we have a number of big events throughout Australia and New Zealand. And I think one thing that really got my attention early on when we first started was there. They certainly got the culture right within this company. Um, the enjoyment factor is huge. Uh, you know, accommodating families is like, you know, we'd have six thousand people at a conference, and there'd be people at the back of the room with their babies and stuff, you know, rolling around on the floor. And I just thought, wow, that's, you know, that's really special. Um, and, and, and it's something that, you know, I'd, I, I would, at the time I was like, man, I'd love to be a part of this, I think, moving forward. And, but also the heart of the company is all about contribution. So, you know, we give to make a wish and we, we do give back days where we, you know, we help the homeless or recently in Fiji, we, went and repaired, you know, classrooms and we built this massive fence for this village. So all of those sorts of things. And I think it just goes back to, you know, finding finding what you're passionate about and, and again, just, just having that belonging to something. So, you know, within our teams, um, you know, obviously we have, you know, team calls and all that sort of stuff, but it's there's nothing like getting face-to-face, uh, you know, with, with your team members and, and getting them in the, in the environment where they can experience that environment, you um, and then when they step out of that, you know they're motivated and ready to go. Yeah, for sure. It sounds like it sounds like it's going really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. And um, I mean, we, we just so we have so much gratitude for the company as well. And it's just great that you know every every day you know people come into the business. It doesn't matter what the background is. Doesn't matter what your qualifications are. You know, we've had doctors give up their roles to come and do this. It's these professional people, tradies. Um, we've got. Uh, such a an awesome group of young people that are also um you know leading the way and it's probably more up the alley you know with all this online stuff so it's something that um i'll sort of have to play a little bit of catch up uh, catch up on with the online um you know social media and all that sort of thing um but just like anything it's all a learning curve but it's exciting Oh, definitely. I've seen you go online though, and I've seen you on on social media. I think you've got it pretty well nailed by now. <laughs> oh, this is, <laughs> you always think you can do a whole lot more, so it's just kind of. And I guess the main thing is it's better to do something than do nothing. So that's where we're at, anyway. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> well, let me ask you one final question, and we might then do the uh, the top ten because I'm aware of the time. But um, yep. Aside from the memories and the experiences, and you've got kids of your own now and things like that, what are some of what's the biggest takeaway you've got from playing team sport at the highest level, and and something that you'd like to pass on to not only your own children but the people you work with, and even the people listening to this podcast? Oh, some of the biggest takeaways. I think contribution is a big thing because I think it's you know we talk about comfort zone. It's it's easy to sit back. And let somebody else, you know, take the lead. I guess, and I, I think it's just really important that if you've got something you want to say, you've got an idea. It's like, you know, just, just, just get it out there. Just have a crack, have a go. Just step into that space, because you know that's where great things happen. So that was something for me. I, I, I probably took out of that as um, being a part of those teams and as actually, you know, stepping up and contributing because I was so used to. Um, you know, not saying anything and, 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 and quite happy to sit on the outside um, of where everything was going on. Um, but biggest thing is you got to enjoy the ride as well. Like we can always get, we always get caught up looking too far ahead. You know, we always, and that was one thing about the All Blacks and even with my Super Rugby side, we were very good at staying in the moment, enjoying the process. And then of course, you know, day at a time. But within that, obviously you've got to set goals and you've got to cast the vision and all that sort of stuff. Um, but definitely enjoy the journey. Really good advice. I love it. I love it. So now we're up to that time, I think, where we're going to go through, if you're up for it, and have a crack at our Barn Raisers top 10. Yeah, okay. You up for it? Okay, let's have a go. All right, let's see how we do. I'm sure you'll go fine. (laughs) All right, question number one. What is one thing you feel must be present or created for a team to succeed? Ooh, I think you've got to have buy-in from everybody. 
uh, where everybody gets to contribute would have to be it. Number two, what is one thing you feel must be avoided or overcome in order for a team to succeed? Uh, alcohol is probably a good thing. However, um, again, probably I think we had leadership groups within our sides that were successful. So I think there's got to be a group of people that are willing to uh, contribute and, you know, for the for the better of the entire team. Yeah, yeah. So being selfless, really. That's it, yeah. All right, number three, what team, I think I know the answer to this one, what team, current or historic, would you love to have been a member of? Um, I mean, I, I would have loved to have been part of the 2011 uh, All Black Rugby team because they won the World Cup. Yeah, oh, for sure, for sure. So I didn't so, get that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number four, who is an ultimate team player in your eyes and why? Um, I would have to say a guy named Aaron Major. He is the current coach for the Highlanders Super Rugby team. Um, he he's just I don't know. He was just the ultimate, just the ultimate guy that could really bind the team together with his leadership and his direction of play. Um, and he commanded a lot of respect. So. Definitely him, Aaron Major. What three qualities make someone a great teammate or colleague? Yeah, I think I think humility, um, honesty. I always like a bit of humour. Yep. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. You've got to be able to have a laugh when it's so serious. That's right. <laughs> All right. What three qualities make someone a great coach or manager? Um, obviously, their ability to communicate. Um, but also, I, I think the relationship that, that they have between the coach and the player. Um, some of the great coaches that I've been involved with, you know, you can be really good friends with that coach, but at the same time they can step out of that and, and, and be a great coach. So I think just finding that, 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 you know, where that boundary is uh, between, um, you know, coach and player. Um, and again, everybody loves an honest coach. So, somebody that is just um you know very transparent and open with 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 where you're at as a player okay great number seven what is one thing that instantly makes you feel part of a team i would have to say if somebody asks you to contribute um or or somebody's asking you um you know what your ideas are for this team i, I think i think that that in itself um is probably something that would probably get me excited about being a part of it. Uh, number eight, what is one thing that instantly makes you feel excluded from a team? Ooh. Yeah, well, probably when you don't get picked and, you, and you're not told why, that would probably be one. Yeah. Uh, but again, that would be, it would just be um, where you, you, you might want to contribute, but you're not getting the opportunity or you don't get asked, um, you know, just the opposite to what I was just saying. So, that would definitely be would probably be it is is we you're not feeling you're in, you're you're inclusive, um, and and you're not being asked for for what you want to share. What is your fondest team memory? Oh, fondest team memory. Oh, it would have to be, I think, being a part of the the Commonwealth Games, winning the gold medal um, in the final against Fiji, and that was in Kuala Lumpur in 1998. Wow. Fantastic. Many moons ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I'm sure if you think about it, it just feel like yesterday. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And our last one, what is the one thing you'd like to hear a coach, manager, boss, or teammate say about you? I, I think just that he's a, good, he's, a, he's a good, honest team man. He's just a good man. I think that would be fantastic. Terrific. Terrific. Well, Rico, as we close this off, there's probably only one thing I was going to ask you, um, which I should have done maybe a bit earlier, but if, if people want to get in touch with you, is there a place where they can, they can get in touch if it's for the business and, and finding out more about that? Is there anything that you want to share with them, something online? or? Yeah, for sure. So um, you can get a hold of me on Facebook, uh, just, just Rico Gear. Um, so I'm under there as a health and wellness coach. Uh, and also on Instagram, 
Um, and that's also Rico underscore gear. Fantastic. All right, I'll make sure I put that in the show notes as well. So if anyone wants to find out what it is you're about or get some help with health and wellness, then definitely um, definitely hook you up on uh, on social media. Ah, oh, wonderful. That would be fantastic. Thank you very much. Not a problem at all. For your time today, for those insights, and for sharing just some of your um, your, your wonderful experiences and insights into what is probably one of the most successful, if not the successful sporting franchises in the history of the world in the All Blacks. Um, I can't thank you enough. So uh, thanks very much for your time. No, my pleasure. Thank you very much for taking the time to um, you know, ask me those questions. And I, and I hope that it uh, has impacted you know, at least one person. That would be fantastic. I'm sure it will. It's impacted me. And uh, from there, it's only up, upside. So um, <laughs> thanks so much. No, cheers, Dan. So what did you think of that? A massive thanks to Rico for that amazing insight into one of the greatest sporting institutions in the world and for being so generous in sharing his personal experiences with the team, the haka and its heritage and also his thoughts on his teammate Richie McCaw. Like I said in the beginning, he really is just a great guy. Now if you're interested in having Rico as your health coach or want to learn more about what he's up to with his business, jump onto Facebook and get in touch. Just look for Rico Gear. And you can also catch him on Instagram, of course, and that address was Rico underscore gear. You'll find both of those in the show notes. And speaking of the show notes, be sure to check out the links that I've put in there, especially if you haven't seen the Hucker before. I've included a few of those YouTube videos I spoke about in the conversation, and you'll be able to watch Rico and the boys in full swing. It's simply awesome footage to watch. So as we wrap up now, I want to take a moment to thank you for being so generous with your time and your help in supporting and getting this podcast off the ground. Not that my opinion counts for a lot, but I really do feel that we're starting to hit our straps and with the guests that I've got lined up, I promise we're about to take this thing to a whole new level. But as I said, my opinion's largely irrelevant. I really want to hear from you guys. So let me know. What do you think? What do you like? What do you not like? If you could just take a few minutes and email me, it's dan at shiftingpeers.com. I'd really appreciate it. I don't bite and I promise I will respond. Also, be sure to follow me on Instagram. I've changed the handle and it's now at Dan J Stones. Of course, you can stay in touch with the show on Facebook or Twitter. It's at Barnraisers Pod. And the website's also there, www.barnraiserspodcast.com. Finally, I also want to remind you that we've now got our Patreon account set up. If you don't know what Patreon is, it's a place where you can support the show and also get some really cool bonuses and some exclusive offers that I've put together, including discounted training packages, access to an exclusive Barn Raisers Team Culture program that I plan on running just for supporters of the show, and there's also some great promotional opportunities if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast as well. The easiest thing to do is head to the website, which you can do by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash barnraisers. That's a pretty long address, but you'll find all the info you need in the show notes, and I'll do a couple of posts on Facebook and Instagram as well. There's a lot of work that goes into this show, and I really would welcome the support, so please check it out. Well, that's it, guys. Another Barn Raisers in the books. Thanks again for your support. I've been Dan Stones, this has been Barn Raisers, and until we meet again, remember, the deepest principle in team dynamics is contribution. If you aren't willing to give, then you aren't going to be effective. <laughs>